government plans through Mutual of America. And we are so, you know, Mutual of America has been a great partner, and we're so thrilled that they are hand-in-hand hand with us right now because it's part of their agreement with us and partnership with us is that they're able to come in and kind of do this education with us. Otherwise, we'll kind of be off on, their own, on our own trying to figure all this stuff out. So Mutual is here to be a resource for all of us, um, all of you. And um, I know Lisa has just been a fantastic partner at our national conferences. She's out with, me, with you at many of your regional events. And they're going to really walk through what the CARES Act provides to us as employers and touch a little bit on those of us who are employees and who have retirement savings and such about perhaps what some of the options are there as well as we navigate the pandemic. So Lisa, thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to turn the ball over to you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Denise, Jovita, and Alexa, for having Carter and I on here today to talk to you about the CARES Act and how it relates to your um, individual retirement plans. Um, you know, first of all, I've been thinking a lot about you guys. Um, we talk a lot about people that are on the front lines, and you guys are really out there, you know, supporting your communities um, at a time when it really matters the most. And, you know, we have about 40 field offices out there in the country that are you know, out there to help support you as well. And so if we can provide a hot meal or lunch to you, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you and your staff during a time that you guys are um, working. Um, been thinking a lot about you guys. Uh, I missed you at Puerto Rico. I was on a plane to get there and had to turn around and come home due to the earthquake. And I was looking forward to seeing you guys in May and April during, um, you know, all your state conferences. And then obviously um, those had to be canceled as well. And so, Really just wanting to be out there and help you as much as we can. Um, we've been providing a lot of educational workshops to all of our clients and really wanted to work with Josita and Denise to offer you guys this educational workshop as well. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Lisa Lowry and, you know, as Denise mentioned, we're a partner with you with your retirement plans. I know we work with about one in every three of you. We don't work with all of you, um, but that's something that you know, my job is really to make sure that you guys know the benefits that are available to you, the cost savings that are available to you, and just the education that's available to you and your employees. And so speaking of education, I really want to introduce you to Carter Adler. He's the one that's going to present to you on the CARES Act. Um, I've nicknamed Carter really the walking encyclopedia, and he's really that uh, consultant that is there for our Ohio Community Action Agency clients to work with them on anything administrative. and. Um, you know, look forward to presenting this to you, and I'll be reaching out to you guys individually as well after um, in the next coming days just to see how we can, you know, assist you and what, what needs that you have from Mutual of America. So hang in there, take care, and I hope to see you all in Seattle soon. Thanks. Carter? Thanks, Lisa. Um, as, as Lisa mentioned, um, my role is working with our clients throughout the state of Ohio uh, on administration and operations of their retirement plan. Uh, and I've uh, been in this industry for about 20 years. Um, we're gonna run through some of the uh, key points and, and highlights of the CARES Act, uh, which is the, uh, the, the last, the, the third, and so far the most recent round of uh, coronavirus stimulus legislation passed by Congress, uh, almost certainly not the last. Um, and uh, I, I want to preface this by saying that uh, we're going to talk about uh, a lot of different features and elements that are in the CARES Act, uh, only some of which pertain directly to retirement plans. There are a lot of other things in there uh, for, for nonprofits uh, as well as small businesses. Uh, and we're going to we're going to touch on and, and talk a little bit about some of those as well, uh, but keep in mind our role and and is really uh, retirement plan specialists. Um, so um, you know certainly uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer as many as we can. Um, but again, uh, primarily focused on the uh, the retirement plan aspects of this. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're going to talk today a little bit about the CARES Act, as well as the, um, some of the related emergency assistance uh, that the government has put out there uh, for small businesses and for nonprofits. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about how we at Mutual of America are able to, to help and support 
uh, our clients in, uh, in dealing with these constant changes. So the CARES Act, again, um, it's intended to uh, provide an, an economic safety net and stimulus. It was passed on uh, March 27th. The full name is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the third uh, and uh, the most recent as of now. Um, and it's uh, to date the most sweeping legislative measure to provide economic safety nets for individuals, businesses, um, and uh, certain industry sectors, uh, and also to provide resiliency, hopefully, for uh, what we don't know how long this is going to last. It, it may be a while that we have this sort of economic uncertainty. Uh, so again, we're going to go through some things, uh, some of which directly are pertaining to retirement plans, retirement plan sponsors as an employer, as well as retirement plan participants, and some things to do with uh, individual investors. Um, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot in the Act. Um, some of the things that are included in that are uh, direct payments to millions of households. Uh, it's based on household income. Uh, I believe they're basing it on uh, 2019 tax returns for people who have filed them. For those who have not filed them yet, they are going back and basing it on 2018 tax returns. Uh, for people who have those tax refunds direct deposited, uh, they are just going back and direct depositing it into those bank accounts. Uh, and I know many people have already been receiving those within the last few days, uh, so that is out there. Uh, also includes emergency access to retirement plan accounts for individuals impacted by the coronavirus. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means and the implications of that. Uh, also, a waiver of required minimum distributions for 2020. Uh, it used to be that uh, once someone stopped uh, working at an employer uh, and reached age 70 and a half, they were required to take a distribution from their plan each year. Uh, just in December and beginning in January uh, of this year, uh, that law was changed from age 70 and a half to age 72. Uh, and now in uh, the CARES Act, uh, that requirement is waived entirely uh, for 2020. Uh, I shouldn't say entirely, there are a few cases where it does still apply. Uh, it also provides loans and grants to small businesses uh, to keep them in operation. And a key point of that is for those who retain their workers. Um, it also provides stimulus funds to help state, local, and tribal governments. Uh, it provides emergency aid to uh, the various state unemployment insurance systems and expanded benefits. I know one piece that was in the news quite a lot uh, was an additional uh, or an extra $600 payment uh, on top of unemployment payments. And it is true that uh, for some people uh, that may actually mean that they receive more in their unemployment pay uh, than they received, than they made when they were working. Um, it also, um, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, small businesses, businesses with fewer than 500 employees but more than 50, uh, are required to provide employers with additional paid sick and family leave. So that's the overview of the, uh, the whole CARES Act. As I said, there's a lot there. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the emergency assistance out that's added for businesses and nonprofits. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that although this may say businesses in time, in places, uh, throughout this is not Strictly speaking of for-profits, it does apply to nonprofits as well. Uh, so small businesses, small employers really, have access to expand, expanded uh, SBA direct lending. Uh, they've established a Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, uh, that creates an expanded authority to guarantee loans for up to $10 million for businesses, nonprofits, veterans organizations and tribal businesses with uh, between 50 and 500 employees. Um, there's a cap on that, uh, on how much any uh, organization can receive. 
Uh, and the borrower, the organization or business does have to make a good faith certification that the loan is necessary due to the uncertainty of economic conditions from COVID-19, that they will use the funds to retain workers uh, and maintain payroll, lease, and utility payments, and they're not receiving, uh, that these funds don't duplicate other funds or other grants that they may be receiving. Uh, one of the best features out there about these loans, though, is that they may, in certain cases, qualify for loan forgiveness. Um, as long as at least 75% of the loan is used for payroll expenses, uh, it is possible that up to 100% of the loan may be forgiven. It effectively converts into a grant if all of those requirements are, uh, are, are followed. Um, key elements of that include requirement that loan proceeds are used for uh, payment of employee salaries and commissions, uh, retirement benefits, payment for vacation, parental, family, and sick leave, uh, health care benefits, insurance premiums. Uh, they can also go to mortgage interest, rent, utility payments, and interest on debt incurred before the COVID-19 crisis. Um, again, there are a lot of uh, a lot of rules, a lot of pieces to that. Um, the biggest piece, of course, that comes into play for us as a retirement plan company is first uh, realizing that payment of retirement benefits is an element of employee compensation and does count towards that 75% that uh, has to be used for payroll expenses. Uh, there's also documentation that may be required as part of this loan application, uh, and uh, we're uh, willing and happy to assist our clients in, uh, in preparing and gathering that information. As I mentioned, another element of this is the emergency economic injury disaster loans, um, which as you can hear is a mouthful, so they're calling it EIDLs, uh, and also loan advances. Um, this includes uh, tribal businesses, cooperatives, uh, employee-owned companies with fewer than 500 employees, any sole proprietor, independent contractor, uh, a whole range there uh, can be guaranteed loans up to $2 million based on the borrower's economic losses. Um, again, unlike those uh, payroll protection loans, the EIDL loan does have to be repaid, uh, but they have very good interest rates and up to 30-year repayment terms. Um, there are also emergency grants that can be issued that's at a, effectively a loan advance. Um, unlike those payroll protection loans, uh, the EIDL loan proceeds can be used for any purpose. Larger organizations, uh, and again, we're talking about not only for-profit businesses, but nonprofits as well, uh, from 500 to 10,000 employees uh, can receive direct loans from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's uh, a guaranteed part of this program that interest will not exceed 2% per year, uh, and repayment of interest and principal can be deferred for up to six months. Uh, requirements for this, uh, organizations taking these loans must retain at least 90% of their workforce with full compensation and benefits through at least September 30th of this year uh, and cannot outsource the jobs for the term of the loan and for two years after the term of the loan. Uh, also, existing collective bargaining agreements and union agreements must stay in place uh, and the organization has to stay neutral with respect to union activities. Um, again, however, uh, these are loans. They stay as loans. They cannot be converted to, uh, to a grant like the PPP loan that we talked about earlier. Another topic that's come up a lot and uh, that that I've personally received a lot of questions from, from our clients uh, throughout Ohio deals with the issues of furloughs and layoffs. Um, 
So I like to start by being clear about the terms, and you can see them on the right side of the slide there. Uh, but at a basic le level, uh, a layoff is considered a separation from service. Someone who is laid off is not an employee. Uh, there may be some expectation that they may be rehired at a later time, um, but for the time being, they are not an employee. Uh, as a laid off employee, uh, dealing with their retirement plan, they are eligible as any terminated employee would be uh, to take a full distribution from their retirement plan. Um, if, they're, uh, if they don't meet certain age uh, or COVID-19 related uh, waivers, uh, withdrawn funds may be subject to a 10% tax penalty, as is normally the case. Uh, a furlough, on the other hand, uh, is uh, a suspension of work without pay. Uh, that means that furloughed employees are still employees. They continue to be treated as employees for retirement plan purposes. And so that means if the plan does not allow them an in-service distribution, they do not automatically have access to all their money. Uh, however, if the plan allows, they can take hardship withdrawals, loans, or any in-service withdrawals allowed by the plan. And there are also some special rules in the CARES Act pertaining to the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, one note, though, is that uh, for organizations providing paid sick leave, or rather required to provide pay, paid sick leave, uh, a furlough may not occur until that paid sick leave expires. So let's talk a little bit more about those distributions and implications of uh, layoffs. Um, and again, this is something that uh, we've taken a number of questions from. Um, you know, we've had some organizations, um, you know, especially some that, that many of their operations fall into non-essential categories uh, in areas that have been shut down uh, that have had to either furlough or lay off uh, substantial portions of their employee base. Uh, one of the things that can happen uh, from layoffs, if more than 20% of a retirement plan's participants are laid off or terminated within a plan year uh, and still hold account balances, uh, something called a partial plan termination occurs. Um, and that requires that all those terminated employees, all those laid off employees must be made fully vested in their account balances, regardless of what the normal vesting schedule might have been. Um, now for uh, any participants who continue to be employed, that partial plan termination has no real impact. Um, that also requires then some special reporting uh, potentially on IRS Form 5300, as well as IRS Form 5500. Um, and again, if, for our clients, uh, those are all aspects of that uh, that we're happy to help with. Uh, some additional pr provisions out there uh, coming from the uh, the CARES Act, and again, these vary. These may be things if you have questions to talk to uh, your attorney or your accountant about. Uh, there are options for delayed payment of employer payroll tax. Uh, employers as well as self-employed individuals can defer payment of the employer share of Social Security tax uh, that's to the federal government. Uh, there's also an employee retention tax credit for employers subject to closure due to COVID-19. It's a refundable tax credit for 50% of wages paid by employers to employees during the COVID-19 crisis. The idea of a lot of this is, uh, especially because so many people uh, receive uh, health insurance through an employer, uh, and also to try to keep people uh, off of unemployment systems, uh, that the government is, is basically trying to incentivize employers uh, to continue to pay and to continue to retain employees rather than laying off or furloughing them. Um, there's also a payroll tax credit relief for uh, COVID-19 related sick leave. 
Um, there's the ability uh, to use net operating losses uh, by the direct loan program borrowers. Uh, they've expanded business interest deduction, uh, changed some of the tax loss, net operating tax loss uh, rules, um, and modified, or I'm sorry, temporary repeal of excess business loss limitation rules. Um, again, some of these get into questions uh, that are, are more to speak with an accountant or um, corporate finance person uh, as they get farther and farther from the retirement plan. Another area that we are here to help our clients on is employee education. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, right before everyone started shutting down uh, for the COVID-19 crisis, the stock market was going crazy. Uh, at one point, I think within a, uh, a week and a half or a two week period, uh, we had both the uh, five largest single day losses and the four largest single day gains, uh, all within a, a week and a half or a two week period. Um, and so I know a lot of people uh, are or were at least very nervous about uh, investment performance, the stock market, and what's going on there. Um, so we believe in times like this, uh, education can help calm nerves and can lead to uh, your employees making better decisions regarding their retirement plan. Um, we want to provide them with the knowledge and information that they need uh, to be comfortable with what's going on in the stock market. Um, and um, our, our participant account representatives uh, are available to uh, not only do group presentations for employees, uh, but also to meet with and speak one-on-one -on -one with employees about investment performance uh, and how to deal with uh, this kind of uh, stock market turmoil. Um, as part of that, we uh, normally discuss, you know, the, the market ups and downs. Uh, as uh, I looked at the, uh, the stock market this morning, it looked like um, from the peak to the uh, low point, uh, we've already recovered uh, over half of the loss uh, just within a few weeks. Uh, and so that's part of what we like to talk about and, and emphasize to participants, um, you know, to make investment decisions and retirement plan decisions not based on short-term market ups and downs, uh, but over long-term investment goals. And again, when we talk about retirement, that is always a long-term investment goal, even for people who are nearing retirement age. So again, we see this as um, educating and giving your employees the information they need to make good decisions. Our goal is not to tell people what to do with their investments or what to do with their retirement plans, but to provide uh, all of your employees with the information and the knowledge that they need to make good decisions for themselves. We want to empower them uh, to take control of their retirement finance. So a quick review, and I alluded to this earlier, uh, the CARES Act, in addition to all those provisions I talked about that are uh, employer focused, also has a lot that relates to assisting employees. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some relaxed rules on taking emergency withdrawals from both employer-sponsored retirement plans and from IRAs. Um, qualified individuals, and a qualified individual is someone who uh, either has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or has a spouse or dependent who's been diagnosed with it, or, and this I think is where many people will fit, has experienced uh, negative financial consequences as a result of quarantine, furlough, layoff, reduced hours, lack of child care, or business closure. So anyone who fits into those categories is a qualified individual. Um, they are eligible to uh, take up to $100,000 in total from retirement accounts. Obviously, we encourage people to look at any other sources of income or assets before tapping funds from retirement plans uh, because of the long-term implications uh, of, of 
removing that from their retirement account. But certainly it is there in, a, in an emergency or as a, a, uh, a last ditch situation uh, for someone who does need that. Um, the CARES Act also expanded the loans that can be taken against retirement plan balances. Uh, in the past, loans were limited uh, to 50% uh, of an account balance uh, or $50,000. Uh, temporarily, for qualified individuals, loans can be taken up to $100,000 and up to 100% uh, of their vested balance. Um, and loan repayments can be delayed for one year. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, retirement plan participants do not have to take uh, normal required minimum distributions in 2020. Uh, again, that's complicated. These are some general rules. Uh, there are exceptions to, to uh, almost anything. There are a few cases where requirement, required minimum distributions are still needed this year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it extends and expands unemployment insurance. It adds $600 to each unemployment insurance recipient's normal state payments uh, through July 31st. And again, it is possible that, that for some individuals, uh, especially lower paid individuals, uh, that may mean that they're actually receiving more pay from unemployment uh, than what they were making when working. Um, it also provides for those direct stimulus payments uh, that are up to $1,200 plus $500 per child uh, to adult single taxpayers um, and uh, increased uh, $2,400 to married filing jointly. Um, there are uh, limits, income limits and phase outs on that. Uh, for example, the, uh, a single taxpayer, uh, it phases out beginning at $75,000. Uh, so higher earners may have a reduced stimulus payment or um, not see it all together, depending on those income limitations. Um, also, uh, and uh, this is very timely given today's date, uh, it's not part of the CARES Act, but the IRS and Department of the Treasury did extend the tax deadline until July 15th. Uh, and that also means on a retirement standpoint, uh, individuals do have until July 15th to make contributions to IRAs as well as health savings accounts for the 29 tax year. So those are still available. Other things that are, are going on and part of this, um, there's a, uh, a, a direct reduction of taxable income. Basically, they've changed how, duck, how tax deductions can work in some cases uh, so that it's a direct reduction of taxable income uh, for individual contributions to churches and charities up to $300 for this year. Uh, in effect, rather than a deduction, it almost acts like a tax credit. Uh, so that's a lot more valuable, trying to encourage people who are able to make those charitable contributions. Uh, employees may contribute, or I'm sorry, employers may contribute up to $5,250 a year toward an employee student loans without including that in income. Uh, that's for payments made uh, from March 27th uh, through January 1st, 2021. Uh, there's also increased flexibility for student loan borrowers in repaying loans or grants. Um, in, uh, in many cases, uh, loans may be, um, or loan payments may be suspended for anywhere from three to six months. Uh, there are also expanded options with telehealth services, uh, including things unrelated to COVID-19. A part of that, of course, is uh, trying to keep people who do not have COVID-19 out, uh, out of doctor's offices, out of hospitals. Uh, the, uh, those direct taxpayer stimulus payments, the, the $1,200 per single person, $500 per child, et cetera, uh, are excluded from taxable income. That is not taxable money. Um, there's also uh, the, uh, the additional $600 of unemployment compensation is excluded from income 
for purposes determining eligibility for Medicaid and uh, Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, and there is a requirement for health insurance to provide rapid coverage for qualifying coronavirus prevent, uh, preventative services. Uh, so that's, again, more of, of what's in the CARES Act. I, I know there's a lot, and there are a lot of other things going on that are related but not in the CARES Act. For example, uh, I mentioned that uh, extension of the tax filing deadline to July 15th, uh, not in the CARES Act. Another change that has just recently been announced, uh, also not in the CARES Act, uh, is uh, for retirement plan sponsors uh, with, uh, well, the largest group will be retirement plan sponsors with a July 1st plan year. Uh, that's a plan you're running July 1st to June 30th. Uh, the Form 5500 reporting deadline, the normal uh, extended final deadline would have been April 15th. Uh, just within the last day or two, uh, there's been announced that uh, that deadline is extended as well. Uh, so there are a lot of other things like that, a lot of deadline extensions that are happening even uh, outside of the CARES Act itself. All right, so let's take some questions. And I see one, a request, a, will you provide the exceptions to the waiver of the 2020 RN? Uh, give me a moment to grab that because that's not necessarily a simple answer. Uh, I know one exception has to do with retirement plan type. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, RMD waiver applies to 401A, 401K, 403B, uh, simple, uh, simple IRA, simple 401K plans, uh, IRAs, governmental 457s, uh, but there are a few types of plans that it does not apply to. So for example, uh, one case where it does not apply is uh, traditional defined benefit pension plans. Um, if, if someone is, is up for a required minimum distribution in a traditional defined benefit pension plan, uh, they will still have to receive their required minimum distribution for 2020. Uh, that's probably the largest case. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are probably a few other sort of limited edge cases, um, but for the most part, if we're talking about 401k, 403b, uh, IRA, uh, those type of plans, 401A plans, um, generally the 2020 required minimum distribution is waived. Uh, let's see, some questions about the stimulus payment there. Um, clients who owe the federal government for back taxes, will they receive a stimulus check? Uh, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, uh, again, our focus primarily is on the retirement plan side of things. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of have to guess maybe not, but uh, that would just be a guess. Uh, I would recommend there uh, to uh, look to a, a tax advisor for that. Um, I can certainly look into that and try to get an answer, though. Um, Another question is, uh, if you got a $1,200 payment based on your 2018 return, but would not have been eligible for it based on your 2019 return, so someone who hasn't yet filed their 2019 return, uh, and maybe they saw their income go up or other circumstance change, uh, they received it but wouldn't have been eligible based on the 2019 return, how is that treated in 2020? Uh, again, this is potentially something more for a tax advisor. Um, I, I've, that's a question that I have tried to look into, and I've seen uh, some contradictory answers to that. Uh, I've seen some things that suggest that uh, it, it's not repaid and it, it's not counted in any way towards 2020 taxes. Uh, I've seen other things suggest uh, that it may be treated uh, as sort of an advance on taxes. Uh, there was a past stimulus, I think maybe 2008, but I'm not 100% on that, uh, where stimulus checks were sent, uh, but then when you filed your taxes, that stimulus check was treated as an advance 
on any tax refund. Um, I've seen some suggestions that that may be the case here, but I've also seen suggestions that that's not the case. Uh, so I, I do not have the answer uh, to that one. That would be one to ask uh, a, uh, a tax advisor. Um, let's see. A question about the $600 unemployment or the $600 additional unemployment payment. Again, that's a $600 payment that is uh, on top of normal unemployment paid. Uh, the information I have uh, is that those additional unemployment compensation uh, are excluded from income for purposes of eligibility for Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, I have not seen anything stating that those additional unemployment payments are exempt from uh, normal income tax, for example, uh, or, or other taxes. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I haven't seen anything that says that it is not taxable. I would assume based on that that it's probably treated like normal uh, unemployment payments. Um, a question, someone, uh, my retirement age is 66. How does distribution of my retirement plan work? Um, uh, that's sort of a, an individual question, really, and that's one of the aspects where we at Mutual of America work with, uh, work with you and work with your employees as they approach retirement and even into retirement um, to help them strategize. You know, you get to this point, you get to 65, 66, 67, uh, and you've accumulated a, a sum of money in a retirement plan, and all of a sudden you're faced with a question that people don't often talk about, which is how do I take this lump of money that I've accumulated and uh, turn it into retirement income for myself? Uh, that's really a, a personal question. Uh, the answer to it is going to be different for each individual, uh, and that's where uh, our one-on-one -on -one individualized uh, participant account representatives can help your employees uh, to figure out what's going to make the most sense for them. Uh, I see another one, another question asking about a gap for youth, uh, youth who are over age 17 uh, but may still be claimed as a dependent. Um, is there a gap where people are not going to get their own stimulus check, but um, they're not claimed as a, a dependent? Um, you know, again, that's getting into a little closer to the tax side questions of you know who is a dependent, when are they a dependent, um, and and that sort of gets really outside of of uh, our area of expertise. Any other questions? I will say one question that we've uh, received a couple of times is just related to the PowerPoint presentation and whether or not folks Thank can you. expect to receive a copy of that. I don't, just, can, uh, can we provide that? Yeah, I would say we can provide this uh, copy to you guys. That way you have it. And then um, as you'll see there, my contact information is there, my phone number and my email. So any questions that come up from this, I know um, some may be individualized questions. We'd be happy to get back to you on that um, and even have Jovita distribute to the group as well if it's a common question. So um, thank you again. I think there was one last question that may have come through. Yeah, I, I just saw that one and that's actually a, a great question. Uh, it says, for hardship withdrawals for a COVID-19 reason, uh, what documentation would be required from the employee to substantiate this? So first I want to clarify because there are two different things there, and, and just to be clear on terms, uh, the special COVID-19 withdrawals, uh, although they're similar in some ways to hardship withdrawals in that they allow an employee access to the money that they would not or normally be able to withdraw. 
uh, is, is treated differently from hardship withdrawals in other ways. And the key element of that is uh, that the, uh, there is no documentation. Uh, so for, uh, normally for a hardship withdrawal, uh, and generally limited to certain allowable expenses, uh, things like uh, rent if someone is facing imminent eviction, mortgage payments if they're facing imminent foreclosure, uh, burial or funeral expenses for a spouse or dependent, uh, medical expenses, tuition for an upcoming semester at an accredited college or university, uh, purchase of a home that will be the participant's primary residence, for those normal hardship withdrawals that, that we're all familiar with in retirement plan operations, uh, there is a requirement to uh, obtain documentation, supporting documentation uh, from the employee uh, as to the, the type uh, and the dollar amount that's needed. Uh, for the COVID-19 withdrawals, um, because there is no special criterion under that and other than that, an individual be a qualified individual. Uh, they do not have to meet that. Uh, and the CARES Act does specifically say that an individual, uh, an employee, can represent to the employer that they are a qualified individual, and the employer can rely on that representation alone. There is no additional documented evidence needed uh, for the COVID-19 distributions. Um, we believe as a best practice uh, that that representation should be received in writing, not verbally. Uh, and, um, you know, for our clients, uh, we have a form that we ask employees to sign off. Again, it simply self-certifies that they are a qualified individual. We're not getting documentation, but we are trying to get that self-certification either in writing uh, or for things that can be done uh, over the phone uh, on a recorded phone line. I see some other comments here. Uh, IRS.gov has a specific web page dedicated to those stimulus payments. Uh, you may find many of the answers to questions about those stimulus payments uh, on the IRS website. Uh, is there a maintenance fee on a 403B once you start taking distributions? Um, well, I mean, that is going to depend on your 403B provider. Obviously, I can only speak about uh, what Mutual of America does. Uh, for Mutual of America, there are no additional fees or charges that are imposed by us uh, on employees or on former employees, terminated employees. Uh, by virtue of the fact that they're terminated. We also do not charge any withdrawal or distribution fees as well. Um, so uh, someone who, for example, is retired and starts taking oh, a, a monthly withdrawal of, of $500 a month, uh, they would not suddenly see any additional or any new fees starting up at that time. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions. Thanks again for joining everybody. Uh, thanks, Jovita, Carter, Alexa. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.